All right. Thank you, Carolyn. We're, we're going to finish an outline tonight that we started several weeks ago, and it's uh, presenting Christ to a lost culture. And if you don't have yours, uh, there, there's some laying here, and uh, I'm not going to bring them around, but you can come grab one right quick if you, if you need to, if you want one. We're down to number five on that sheet. And uh, so does anybody need one? Somebody's got some music playing somewhere. Is that, is that Bonnie's bunch or that bunch? Uh. Are they playing that, whatever they're playing? Beach ball, beach volleyball? They're going outside at the Too hot. We're not going to go outside and play beach volleyball. We're going to stay in here and play suck up the air conditioning. <laughs> and I'm going, to, I'm going to try to win. All right, we're still in 1 Peter. We're in the second chapter. And we're, we read, and I'll reread it again tonight from verse 1 through 12, and it says this, beginning in verse 1, Therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the, the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted the word, his gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. And he's going to quote from back in Isaiah. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you, or so that, you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. We've covered the first five on, on this sheet. And, and we began several weeks ago with the, with a little bit of a story about uh, about Kanishi and how Kanishi before he died he came to faith in Christ and somebody asked him how that happened and he said well it was because of the testimony of a lot of the people that I put to death because they had a testimony of Christ and their love for him and it affected him so that before he was before he was I believe he was hanged before he was hanged. He gave his life to Christ. So we began talking about how do we, how do we present Christ to a culture such as the one we live in? And what do we have in this relationship that we have with, with Jesus Christ? And we've covered four of them. We're on number five. We have a union with Christ. We have communion with Christ. We have security in Christ. And we have affection for Christ. And here's number five. It, it, we find it in verse number nine. We have been chosen by Christ. We have been chosen by Christ. Now we all, most of us, I suppose we can remember, being in elementary school, and, and we used to go outside for PE, and we would play kickball, softball, football, some kind of ball or something like that, and you always had to pick teams. Well, they always usually would pick the best two people seemingly to be the team captains and I was never a team captain but when when they would begin to pick teams you would when it was a certain one's pick and if you wanted to be on that team you would get where they could see you. and you'd say pick me pick me pick me pick me if it was the other guy picking and you really didn't want to be on his team you kind of hid behind somebody else so that he thinking that he didn't see you 
Well, that, that's kind of the way that we were we, we were chosen in, 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 doing, in doing something like that. Well, Scripture teaches us that we have been chosen when, now you, you have to put on your thinking cap for this, but we were chosen by God before there was even anybody else, in essence, to choose from. Scripture tells us that we were chosen by God before the foundations of the world were. That means there are no Old Testament people at that time. There are certainly no New Testament people at that time. In fact, there's nothing in this whole universe to speak of, or anything, other than God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So back there when there's only, only the triune Godhead, the Trinity, God, who in his omniscience, and just one of them omni things, in his omniscience, he already knew that you were going to trust him and you have been chosen by God even before the foundations of the world were. So if we come along and we begin to say, well, when I was 16, when I was 17, when I was 8, when I was 9, I decided to trust Christ. That's really not true. He chose you. He chose you, and, and, and Scripture teaches us, teaches us that very thing. He, said, he, he says that we're a chosen, depending on your translation, it, it, it either uses the word generation or the word grace. Now, we, this past week, a week ago from tomorrow, a week from tomorrow, we, we celebrated our independence as a nation. And, and I'm supposing, all except that girl that plays soccer that had purple hair, all except her, most of the rest of us, we're proud to be Americans. We realize our country has difficulties, and we, we, we all realize those things, but... But, 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 but we, we, we have pride in our country, but, but we're, we're something greater than Americans. There's, I can't think of another nation in this world that I would want to be a, uh, a member of. I can't think of one that I would want to be a, 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 a citizen of other than the United States of America, but I'm thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. But I'm more grateful to be a citizen of another world. I hadn't got to go there yet, but one of these days I'm going, and I'm going to get to go because, because I have been chosen by God. Listen, everything that we have down here, as what depended, it doesn't matter what nation we're from or where our citizenship may lie. You see, all of this is, the, the, the word is transitory. That just means it's, it, it, it's temporary. It, it, it's not going to last. We're a Everything that everything down here has its beginning and has its ending. But when we talk about the things of God, listen, I, I'm already a citizen of heaven. I, I, th there was a psalm some years ago that said, I'm a citizen of two worlds. And I'm a citizen right now of this world, but the day's going to come when I'll no longer be a citizen of this world. But I'm going to be a citizen of heaven because I've been chosen by God and, and, he, and he saved me, and, and, and he, has provided, he has provided a place for me. So, so when you begin to think about him, and we, we wonder, we've got little signs up, did you there, and there's one by the outside door over there, did you, and if you come on Sunday night, then you know what those words mean. Well, I, I, I believe tonight that one of, or probably the most worship motivating thoughts of, of, of all time, or we could even call it worship motivating doctrines of all time, comes from the fact that before the foundations of the world were, God in his omniscience knew that you and I were going to come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he was going to save us. He, he, he knew those things. And, and so, so that's just one of the things that we have in this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ as Christians is we have been chosen by Christ. Here's number six. And you can put a number seven because it needs to have a seven down there. And I didn't catch it in time to, to, to change it. But number six is, is we get to reign with Christ. We get to reign with Christ. Now, in, in Revelation 1, 6, we, we read these words. It says, and has made us kings and priests 
to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, so that's sort of the introduction of, of Revelation, the, the first chapter. Then in Revelation number two, we began a series of letters, okay? And in, in Revelation two, there's letters to four different churches. In, in chapter two, there's the loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, and the corrupt church. You get to Revelation chapter three, there's three more letters to, to three more churches. One's the dead church, one's the faithful church, and one is the lukewarm church. You get to Revelation chapter 4, and, and John is getting privy to see a picture, if you would, or the vision, or whatever we would call it, of the throne room of, of heaven. And then in chapter 5, the Lamb of God takes the scroll, and this verse appears, again, that sort of reiterates what was said in Revelation 1.6. And it says in Revelation 5.10, And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, this word kings comes from the word, if I pronounce it correctly, basilio. And that word simply means first in rank and power. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. Foundation of power, sovereign and royal priesthood. Then the word priest that he uses in both of those verses, it just means first in rank or power Magistrate. So here's the picture that we began to put together from several weeks ago. The scripture says that he is building a building. Okay? Who's the cornerstone? Jesus. He is. And the cornerstone does what? It makes everything else correct. Okay? It makes the wall going, if we're talking about a literal house, it makes the wall going this way straight. It makes the wall going this way straight. It makes the wall going this way straight. Well, we can't be the cornerstone because we couldn't keep it straight. So he is the cornerstone. But, but then he comes along and he, he referred to us as living stones. Well, why would we be living stones? Well, we're living stones because we're indwelt by the living God and, and the Holy Spirit of the living God. So, so, so he's the cornerstone. We're the, we're the living stones. It's, it's not just, a, it's not just a, a temple, it's not just a dwelling place, it's a, it, we, we, we could call it a, a palace. A, scripture doesn't refer to us just as priests, but it, it refers to us as, as, as royal priests. And, and, and Scripture tells us, we read this in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, in the 12 verses Paul is writing to, to, to young Timothy. He makes the statement, he says, he says to Timothy, we will reign with him. In, in, in the day to come. So, so, so he says that we're a holy nation and, and a holy nation of, are, are a people for God's own possession. And, and, and listen, whatever nation we belong to down here is temporary. But, but we, belong, we belong to him and we belong to down here. Peter said this when he started this back in chapter one. He talked about how the people that he was writing about he said, "You're sojourners, you're pilgrims. You're just you're just passing through." You get you get to that you get that same idea in the eleventh verse of this second chapter when he when he says you're you're an alien or or sojourner and, and a pilgrim, a stranger in this world, because we belong to another race. See, this is this is not all that there is. We're not just going to live our 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years and kick the bucket and put get put in a box and have some dirt thrown over us because all of this is just transitory. One of these days, we're going to get to go to this place that Jesus has prepared because, because we're going to have the ability to, to, to reign with him. And, and, and the scripture tells us that. What well, You say, well, what, why, why, why would we be referred to as a holy nation? Because the scripture says that none of us are holy. We're not righteous. But whose righteousness have we been imputed with the righteousness of Christ. So we have just been declared righteous by putting our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. And it's all because of him. It's the, the, the word that he uses here, that, that word nation is, is the word ethnos. And that's, that's the Greek word. And, and our ethnos, our ethnicity is not down here. Our, our ethnicity is heavenly. And, 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 and that's, why, that's why one of these days we get to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever we are down here is pretty insignificant. 
In fact, it, it, it's almost irrelevant because we're a chosen race and, and, and we're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation and we're a part of a people that is possessed and have been purchased by God. I, I, I'm telling you, that's, that, 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 puts us in, that puts us in pretty high cotton. Now, now, now Scripture goes on, and, and, and I thought of a verse, I didn't get it on your sheet there, Linda, but uh, you, you remember the verse out of 2 Corinthians 5, 17? It begins this way, it says, If anyone is in Christ, okay? Now in Christ, that we understand that we're Christians, okay? If anyone is in Christ, it says he is a new creation. And then there's I don't, different translations use different uh, commas and whatever, whatever all the other deals they are. But, but there's, there, there's a mark there. But then it says this. It says old things, what have they done? They passed away. And, and behold, all things are what? They're new. Well, what, what, what has happened here? Well, what has happened here is, is when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation, we, we place our faith and trust in Christ, we have been transferred. Have you ever been transferred on a job? Most of you probably have. Transferred from department to department, transferred from company to company. And, you know, as you move up the, if you move up the business ladder, sometimes if you move on up, you get a, you get a better office and you get a little better pay standard and, and different things like that. Well, when we trusted Christ, we got a transfer. And what happened is this. We got transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And that would be Jesus. And in that transfer, that's when we came to be in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, whenever, whenever it is that you got saved, then, then these old things, this is the separation we have. The old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That's, that, that's, a, that's a separation. Our world has a lot of separations in it. If we were to think about it, we, we, would, think about a, we, we would think about a legalist. And what, what would we think of if we thought about the separation that a legalist would have? Well, their separation would be is you can be one of us if you perform certain acts. You do certain things, and this way and this way at this time. Well, that's not the separation of, of, of Scripture. That, that's not the way that we get separated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Then there would be the separation of, of, of an old monk somewhere over in, over in Tibet somewhere. And, and a monk separates aesthetically. That means that he goes and he crawls in a cave. And he sits there and he stares off into the darkness. And he just hums to himself. Some of you may do that sometime. I don't know if you do or not. He just sits there in the darkness and hums to himself and, and, and sits in that cave and stares off into the isolation. Well, that's not the separation that we got when we come to Christ. Then, then there's the separation of the Stoic. And, and, and the ultimate in Stoicism is that we would reach a point in our life where we would just sort of try to separate ourselves from the world is that we would become indifferent to everything. And, and, and that's how they would disconnect from the world. And, and, and that's not the separation. What has happened to us as a child of God is we have been separated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, all because we placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ who chose us before the foundation of the world world. Woo! Yeah. A legalist can't separate himself from sin. He can't do it. Because inside, a legalist is still... Remember, remember the old, isn't it amazing grace? That, that talks about saving an old wretch like me. Isn't that, isn't that the right song? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I said a few minutes. <laughs> a, a legalist can't separate himself from sin because inside, he's still a wretched sinner. An aesthetic can't separate himself from sin because, because truth be known, his mind and his heart, they're, they're full of sinful and wretched and vile things. A stoic can't separate himself from sin because his sin is, is that he finds all satisfaction and indifference to, to everything but himself, and, 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 it's, and it's almost self-idolatry. The only kind of separation that we can really get from the world of darkness 
is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you've been saved by the grace of God and the mercy of God, you have been separated from that world. And, 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 and we have that at, through, through this relationship with Christ. Now, I told you there could be a number seven, and here, here's the number seven. Not, not one on there, but you can put it on. We have mercy in Christ. We have mercy in Christ. I don't know if you did this when you was a kid or not, but when I was in school, we got up late elementary school, junior high, and we quit in high school because it didn't look good for boys to be holding hands with each other. But we played a game called Mercy. You ever played Mercy? Mercy, Randy, I, we're not going to play because you just beat me. But to play Mercy, you got up there and you spread your fingers. And you hollered, get ready to go, and you, you tried to bend somebody up underneath until they finally hollered, and I would have hollered, mercy, but until they said mercy. And that just means that they quit, they're, or they're supposed to quit. They didn't always quit. They, sometimes they, they just didn't. Well, we, we have received in Christ mercy. Then, let's, back in verse number 10. Verse number 10 says, you were once not a people. But now you're the people of God. How, how would that have been brought about? Through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Then it says, you had not received mercy. But now you have done what? You, you've received mercy. Well, how did we come to be a part of the people of God? How, how, did, we come to, how did we come to be a, a Christian? Well, we, we know from Scripture that it wasn't through works. Because Jesus told us, he said, he said, if you could have been saved by works, you would have gone out and you would have bragged about it to somebody. So I said, it, it, it couldn't be that. So it's not through works. Could it be through achievement? Could we do 14 different things? And when we got that 14th one done, we could get a certificate from the church and, and, and that would pronounce us a Christian. No. You were saved by mercy. By, by the mercy of God, you're, the scripture says you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. It, it says you, you had not received mercy, but, but now you've received mercy, and, and mercy is undeserved kindness. I'm going to burst some of you's bubble right quick. None of us deserve to be saved. Amen. If you put all of our deservedness together and made one what we would call super person, that super person with all of our deservedness all made up into one person, we still wouldn't deserve to be saved. But it was through the mercy of God and the undeserved kindness that, that, that He has for us, that, that, that He saved us and brought us into the people of God. And, and all of this was set in motion before the foundations of, of the world were. So, so if we say, what does it mean to be a believer in Christ? Or what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, it, it means all of these things that we've talked about over the past several weeks. All of these things, we, we, we were the people, now we are a people, but then we're only a people by mercy. The Apostle Paul, when, when Paul was in, in his testimony to Timothy, he was telling him what he used to be like. And, in, and, and he, he told him this, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't think I have it exactly right, but he said, I, Paul, I was a blasphemer. I was injurious. I was a murderer. But then he said this. He said, but God showed me mercy. For some of us tonight, we may have a testimony a little bit like Paul. We might could insert words in there. I was a drunk. I was this. I was that. I was a carouser. I was I, whatever adjectives we would stick in there to, to describe the life that we used to live. But then we'd come down there to that same part that Paul come to. But then God showed me mercy. Aren't you glad he showed you mercy? Amen. I'll tell you tonight, I've, I've never been drunk in my life. And I don't anticipate at this point that I'll ever, ever do that. I've never committed adultery. I don't anticipate that ever happening. But did you know it took the same mercy from the same God to save me? as it would the most heathen person, and, and I'm not better than anybody, to save the most heathen person that ever walked the place. 
Every one of us. We, we may not live in the same community. We may have different bank accounts. Some of us may drive a car off the low price side of the lot and some of you may buy them off the expensive side of the lot and some of us may live on the we we call it the tracks you remember when somebody would say somebody come from the other side of the track <coughs> you may come from the other side of the track i live right by the railroad track depending on where you're standing i was on one side or the other but it doesn't matter because the only thing that can save any of us is the grace and the mercy of god and and and, and, and listen God has given us all of these things through this relationship with Jesus Christ. So you say, well, well Brother Steve, why has God poured all those things into us? You, you, you go back and you begin, you, you begin rereading from, from verse 4 down through where we're at here in this passage. And, and, and you're, and you're going to find out. He didn't just pour some good things. He was lavish toward us. In, in all of the things that he's given us and, and that he provides for us. But he tells us why. There are two so that's in this passage of scripture. One is in verse 9 and one is in verse 12. Look at, look at verse number 9. He, he, has give, he has given us all of these things. When you get down to verse number 9, it says... In, in the middle of that verse, it says, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we say, well, why has the Lord granted us all of these things? Why has he been so, why has he so lavishly blessed us? Did you catch the reason why? So that you, so that we, would go out there and proclaim the excellencies of him to a lost and dying world. I, I wasn't alive, but I believe that, it, that that's the very reason that, that old, the murderer Konishi gave his heart and life to Jesus before he died is because he saw men and women who, that go into their death still clinging and claiming hope and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it impacted his life. Whose life is your life impacting by your faith and trust in Christ? He has been, we, we, we all say these things, and God is good. We even sing the little song sometimes, God is so good. Well, the reason God is so good to us, he loves us, granted. But he is, he is good to us so that we go and tell other people what he has done in and through us and that he can do the same for them. Amen. That's, that's why he's good to you. He, he is not good to you and he is not good to me because we deserve it. I didn't deserve to be saved and I, to be saved and I don't deserve his goodness today. But he's blessed us lavishly so that we will go out and proclaim the excellencies of God to a lost and dying world. Then, then he gives us another so that. You go down and you begin to read in verse 11 or so. And he says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. And here's the second so that. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, I'm sorry, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them <clears throat> glorify God in the day of visitation. So he's good to us so that we go out and proclaim, but he's also good to us and we ought to act a certain way. That, that, that's what he tells them there in, 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 in verse number 12. It, it, we're supposed to abstain from fleshly lusts. Listen, we, we, can, we can play like that we don't deal with that, but I'm telling you, everybody in this room deals with fleshly lust in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You say, well, how long will that go on, preacher, till you draw your last breath? And when you get to transfer out of this world and you get to transfer to the place that he's going to prepare, we're going to deal and we're going to struggle with fleshly lust. That's, that, that's just the way it is. But he says, in this relationship, we can abstain from that. 
we, 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 we have that ability and it's important that we do because other people, what are they doing? They're watching us. And, and if we give in to all those things, then, then they've got, we, we know what they're going to say. Oh, so-and-so, he does it. Oh, Miss so-and-so, she does it. That preacher down there, Trinity, he, he does it. So he, said, he says, abstain from those things. They, they war against the soul. Keep, you, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Keep your behavior excellent. Listen, th these people to whom, to whom Peter is writing to, they had been accused of, uh, of, of just about everything. You, you, you go through and you, they have been accused of being rebels, of almost being terrorists. They had been accused of, uh, of, of basically of, of burning Rome, of being atheists because they didn't, they didn't have... Uh, idols like the other people did. They had been accused of being immoral because of, of, of some of the different feasts they had. and They had been accused of doing social damage and, and all of those things. And it just reminds us that, listen, God's people are always under persecution. Always have been and always will be. But even today, just as they were instructed in this day, we're supposed to live above those things. And, and we're supposed to abstain from those things. And, and, and that's what we're supposed to do because, because our testimony and our witness is, is so important. Don't give in and don't, don't sell out to this thing. Well, everybody else is doing it, so it must be okay if I do it. Don't, don't do that. Because our, it, 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 it's so important that, 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 that we stay the course and we, and we, and we hang in there and, and, and do the right thing so that our, so that our testimony shines through. I'm, I'm always, I always remember, and some of you may know this name when I call it, but there was a, there was an old gentleman that lived in our community, and I know Carlo will, but his name was, uh, it's, they, they called him Cricket, and Cricket was a welder for Lufkin Industries for many, many years, and he was a lay preacher, and had just means he'd go fill in and preach wherever it was, and and I remember sitting down with him one time. I was just very young in the ministry, and we had a funeral at, at uh, the old Oakley Metcalf funeral home there in town. And he was sitting there in the preacher room, and I hadn't preached one or two at that, at, that, at that time in my life. And I went in and sat down with him, and he opened his old Bible and had a notebook. And he had written down every funeral that he had done up until this time. This was back in the late 80s. And he said, this is funeral number, and he called the number. I, I wish I could remember what it was. And I just thought as I said, I said, well, you, you've never pastored a church. You've never been the, the preacher of the church. And, 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 then, and then later through the, through the years, we, he and I got close, and I would, I would go and I would sit in his home, and, and, and he relayed a story, and I thought about it today as I was, as I was wrapping this, this little study up. And, he, he, said, he said, Brother Steve, and he talked real slow. It took him a long time to say whatever he was going to say. And he, he, he said, I was a welder there at Lufkin End that called a number of years. And he said, there were men at that time, he said, they would, he said, they'd cuss at me. They'd kind of laugh at me. But he said, he said, what a lot of these funerals that you see in my book and that number had way way grown by this time he said he said many of those are those men that laughed at me and they made fun of me and he said what happened was is he seen is that they seen that even through all of that stuff he said and he he, he made me understand so I'm not perfect but he said I I didn't I didn't spray the course and so when the chips got down and he said a lot of them didn't have a preacher or a pastor to call. He said, they called for me. He said, I'd go to their bedside. He said, I led a number of them to the Lord. And, 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 and they come to know Christ and salvation at that time. And, and he, he said it was, he, and he was trying to encourage me. And he said, it was all because I, I tried to stay the course. I'll tell you tonight, sometimes it is hard to stay the course. Because sometimes you feel like you're the only one trying to stay the course. But it's worth staying the course. Because our lives are impacting people. 
that we don't even know that our lives are impacting because they're just looking from afar and they're watching and they're seeing our life just like Okanishi. I doubt any of those prisoners of war walked up to Mr. Kanishi and said, Mr. Kanishi, I want to lead you to Christ. I doubt that happened. But he continued to watch from afar. And he's seen people that have hope in something, knowing that they were about to go to their grave. And he knew that they had hope. We have that hope. That hope that we have is in Christ. And we have that because of this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Is life hard? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. Is it, 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 it's just tough sometimes. Girl, we've got to stay the course. Because there's people out there that are watching us. And we need to tell them who it is that makes the difference. And I'll assure you, it's never the preacher that makes the difference. It's the Christ that makes the difference. And we're to go and we're to proclaim and tell them about Jesus. What he has done for us and what he will and can or can and will do for others. I trust tonight that we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And through that relationship that we're staying the course to win the more that Paul talked about. It's waiting. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for salvation. Thank you that, and I'll just stand here and have to be honest tonight. I don't understand how before the foundations of the world were that you chose me. I don't understand. But Lord, I stand here tonight and I'm sure grateful. I'm grateful that you presented the opportunity in my life as a 17-year-old boy for me to reciprocate the love that you extended to me to reciprocate that love back to you and place my faith and trust in you to save my soul. Lord, I'm thankful today that you give me the opportunity to, I'm thankful for the call that you placed on my life. I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to preach your word. But Lord, I ask you for help and strength. Not in standing in the pulpit because it sort of just comes easier there. The Lord just out in the highways and the byways and the hedges of life that my life and my testimony would be one that would point people toward the cross of Calvary. And my testimony would be one of the one of the excellences that you have provided and, and poured into my life through this relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray tonight. I pray first that every one of us in this room are saved. And if we're not, that we would trust you before we leave here. But Lord, tonight I, I think more relevant would be that every one of us would leave this place living a life that would reflect you to this culture that we live in. We can talk politics, or we can talk parties, or we can talk all of these things. But Lord, you, you saved us to be a witness in this culture, this day. You knew what this culture would be like, and you have us here to be a light shining into that darkness. So help us to do that very thing. Bless us tonight as we dismiss from here and keep us under your watch and your care and use us to be a blessing to someone tonight. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.